Davis really is the perfect man in a, in a time and in a place where there's a serious shortage of real quality leadership. He really represented everything that the, the Plantation South was about, right? He really believed in patriarchy. He believed in hierarchy. Of course, Davis was in the U.S. Congress, U.S. Senate. He was in the Mexican War. He's a military hero. He's tall. Good-looking, looks great on a horse. So in many ways, he's perfect. Jefferson Davis, the future president of the Confederacy, was born on June 3, 1808, in Christian County, Kentucky. Yeah, when he was a child, the, his father Samuel Davis moved the family to uh, the vicinity of Woodville, uh, Mississippi, where Davis uh, grew to young manhood when he wasn't away attending school. Jefferson Davis's older brother, who was really a mentor and a father figure to him, Joseph Davis, managed to secure for Jefferson Davis an appointment to the Military Academy of West Point in, I believe, 1824. And Davis, as he was about a lot of things throughout his life, was ambivalent about going to West Point. At first he wanted to go, then he didn't want to go. He was going to West Point because his brother wanted him to go and he wanted to please his brother. Despite his indecisiveness, Davis would eventually decide to attend West Point. He was not a stellar student mm -hmm. at West Point. He wasn't at the bottom of his class, but he was nowhere near the top. He was something of a party boy. A number of the West Point cadets, when they could, of course, for generations, would leave the post after hours when they weren't supposed to and go to a local tavern called Benny Havens where they would drink. And the, the, the accommodating Mr. Havens would serve these young men whatever they asked for. He got caught out a couple of times. As a matter of fact, he was brought before a court-martial and dismissed once, then allowed back in on application. In 1828, Davis graduated from the Military Academy at West Point and became a second lieutenant in the United States Army. In 31, Davis was assigned to Fort Crawford, the Prairie du Chien, Wisconsin. At Fort Crawford, Davis met Sarah Knox Taylor, the daughter of the fort's commanding officer, Colonel Zachary Taylor. Knoxy Taylor, as she was known, was the one true love of Davis's life. Colonel Taylor did not approve of the relationship between Davis and his daughter. He arranged for the young lieutenant to be transferred to another assignment. Rather than accept his transfer, Davis resigned his commission and remained at Prairie du Chien. He finally persuaded her family to allow her to marry him. They were married in Kentucky, and he then persuaded her that it was safe to go back to the plantation his brother had set up for him in um, in, in Mississippi, not far from Vicksburg, even though this is the summer in the South, even though Davis himself knew from experience that the summer in the South was the fever season, and he would himself manage to be away from that plantation in the summertime. Uh, she went south with him, and within a matter of three months, they'd both been infected with malaria. She died. Mm. He survived. Sarah's death devastated Davis. Many years later, the sight of her slipper was enough to cause him to pass out from grief. Her death altered his personality forever. The fun-loving, joyful, uh, somewhat irreverent young man of his West Point days disappeared forever, and he became the sober, serious, taciturn Jefferson Davis that history really knows.
For the next eight years, Davis lived in what he would later describe as great seclusion on his plantation in Mississippi. Gradually, Davis would begin to emerge from his shell. In 1843, he would run for a seat in the Mississippi House of Representatives. He lost this election, but at Christmas time, visited his brother Joseph in Natchez and met Verena Banks Howell, the daughter of a family friend, Major William Howell. Verena was in many ways a 20th century woman. She was bright, she was alert, she was accustomed to being involved with the men in political discussions of the day. Though he was 18 years older than she was, Davis was intrigued by her intelligence and personality. Less than a month after meeting her, he proposed marriage and she accepted. A year later, they were married. The relationship was very interesting from a 21st century perspective. He had very specific ideas about womanhood. He really represented everything that the, the Plantation South was about, right? He really believed in patriarchy, he believed in hierarchy, and this was a hierarchy that was not only based on race, but based on sex, right? So that, that women were ultimately dependent on and subservient to men, right? He was the authority in his household. And Verena Howell Davis was not particularly interested in submitting to her husband. So they had quite a rocky marriage. They separated twice. Davis left her at home in Mississippi once he's serving in Congress and went to Washington rather than take her with him because she was, as he put it, so querulous. After the second separation, I think Verena Davis came to the conscious decision to save the marriage by playing the game. And thereafter, she spent years and years being the uh, subservient, obsequious uh, uh, wife. In 1846, a year after they were married, Davis re-enlisted in the Army. The United States was at war with Mexico, and by fighting in this war, Davis hoped to win honor and glory for himself. Davis was given command of a regiment of volunteers and assigned to the army of his former father-in-law, General Zachary Taylor. Taylor blamed Davis for the death of his daughter. Davis's regiment would distinguish itself at the Battle of Buena Vista on February 22, 1846. Davis's regiment was where the fighting was the hottest, and they defeated first one column of Mexican attackers, and then a second. Davis himself was wounded on the, in the foot and had to be carried off the battlefield. When General Zachary Taylor learned of his performance in the battle, he wrote to Davis, My daughter, sir, was a better judge of character than I was. He was lucky because what he did on the battlefield was stupid, but the mm -hmm. Mexican commander facing him did something even dumber. And Davis lucked out and, and had a signal role in this, in this great victory. Based on his status as a war hero, in 1847, Davis was appointed to the Senate. In the Senate, he served as a member of the Armed Forces Committee. In 1853, President Franklin Pierce appointed Davis Secretary of War. He was indeed a micromanager. He, he had the instincts of a bureaucrat. Which made him an excellent Secretary of War. After Pierce's term concluded in 1856, Davis returned to the Senate. He was still serving in the Senate when he learned of the election of Abraham Lincoln in 1860. December 1860, South Carolina seceded from the United States. So in January, five other states seceded from the Union. One of those five seceding states was Davis's home state of Mississippi. Davis would later recall that the day he learned of Mississippi's secession was the saddest of his life. Nevertheless, he wrote a letter to the governor stating, Judge best where Mississippi needs me and place me accordingly. This was resigning from the Senate. Delegates from the six newly independent states were meeting in Montgomery, Alabama. They created the Confederate government uh, and the Confederate States of America. Uh, and Montgomery sort of became, uh, by default almost, the capital of the Confederacy because that's where those men convened. There wasn't a lot of talk about Davis in Montgomery, Alabama. Most people apparently thought that the president would come from Georgia because Georgia was the biggest state. And Georgians mostly seemed to think the president would be former Senator Robert Toombs, who fit this kind of mid-19th century ideal of the larger-than-life man, boastful, outgoing, the master of the bon mot, the life of the party, uh, you know, a great backslapper and a great campaigner. But, uh, Toombs had a problem with drink. He couldn't handle it. 
and the day or a day or two before the president was to be chosen by this small convention, he got drunk at a party and made a fool of himself. So Toombs almost virtually drank himself out of the presidency. The, into this vacuum that a man from Mississippi comes riding up with a letter Davis has written to him in response to some questions, and the letter says, among other things, he would have preferred to be a general in the field rather than to be president, uh, because he felt that's where his, his inclinations and his skills were. But if my country calls, I can't say no. And Davis really is the perfect man in a, in a time and in a place where there's a serious shortage of real quality leadership. He's a plantation owner and a slave owner, so he's part of the group who are bringing about this, this new experiment. He's a military hero. He's tall, good-looking. So in many ways, he's perfect. And when his name is put in nomination, it almost immediately uh, carries the day. <laughs>
and presented to Davis a report on the condition of Lee's army. Sergeant Wise told Davis that after the fall of Petersburg, Lee had attempted to move south to link up with him at Danville. However, General Ulysses S. Grant had blocked Lee's path to the south. Lee therefore had moved to the west, toward Appomattox Courthouse. By the morning of April 9, 1865, Lee's army was surrounded at Appomattox. In an attempt to break this encirclement, Lee launched a desperate assault. Lee's tired, hungry troops were unable to defeat Grant's superior forces, and when the attack failed, Lee had no choice but to meet with Grant and negotiate the terms for the surrender of the Army of Northern Virginia. Essentially, the loss of Lee's army is the end of the war for the Confederacy. Lee's army had become, in the minds of Southern people, in the minds of, I should say, in the minds of Confederate people, to, to be, uh, you know, the, it was the symbol of Confederate sustainability, the revolution's survivability, and once Lee's army was defeated, the cause was lost. Davis learned of Lee's surrender on April 10th. Still determined to continue the Civil War, Davis headed south, hoping to meet with General Joseph E. Johnson. Johnson was the commander of the South's largest surviving army. At the beginning of the Civil War, Davis and Johnson had had a strong relationship. They had known each other during the old army days, and Davis had appointed Johnson commander of one of the South's field armies. However, in the winter of 1861, a series of misunderstandings and miscommunications between the two men had significantly undermined their relationship. By 1865, Davis and Johnson were at each other's throats. Their meeting on April 10, 1865, would prove just as contentious as previous engagements. Johnson urged Davis to negotiate terms of surrender with the Union, where David, which Davis refused to consider. I think he was constitutionally incapable of giving up. Part of the reason being that he viewed the Confederacy as his creation. The Confederacy was his child, just like one of his sons. And Davis is a man who will have four sons and will see all of them die. And I think to him it was no more conceivable that he could oversee the death of the Confederacy than that he could willingly give up one of his sons to die. This eventually agreed to allow Johnson to meet with William Tecumseh Sherman the commander of a Union army. Davis remained at Johnson's headquarters in Greensboro for a few days and then headed south on April 15, 1865. In Washington, D.C., President Abraham Lincoln was taking in a night at the theater to celebrate his victory. During the third act, a young actor named John Wilkes Booth ascended the staircase to the president's box and shot the president in the back of the head. Lincoln died the next morning. Lincoln's assassination would greatly intensify the manhunt for Jefferson Davis. Many Northerners believed that Davis was the mastermind behind Booth's plot to assassinate the president. But Davis would only learn of Lincoln's assassination on April 20th. Davis's reaction to this assassination was somewhat mixed. He believed that Andrew Johnson, Lincoln's successor, was a beast of a man, but that he would ultimately have less influence on the government than Lincoln did. Davis also hoped that Lincoln's assassination would inspire the South to rise up and continue the fight. Hope would prove vain, however. On April 26th, General Johnson had met with William Tecumseh Sherman at Bennett Place, North Carolina, and surrendered his army. When Davis learned of this, he headed south into Georgia who becomes, really after February or March 1865, intermittently, I think, delusional. We'll start talking about riding across Georgia and Alabama and Mississippi and that phantom legions of Confederate men who had deserted or who had been sent home sick or furloughed ill or men who'd avoided the draft because they were Unionists would suddenly take heart and come out of the hills to form a new army with him as its nucleus, that's just a pipe dream. May 4th, Davis reached the small town of Washington, Georgia. There he convened a meeting of his cabinet in the courthouse. 
he tried to convince his cabinet to cross the Mississippi with him and continue the Civil War. All say the game is over. It's time to give up. It's time to get you out of the country and time to surrender our forces everywhere. They tried to convince him to take a ship to Havana, Cuba. David, when Davis left Washington that same day, he seemed to be following their advice. It's pretty evident that in fact he's talking about using that boat to get across the Gulf of Mexico to Texas, where there is still, he believes, a large Confederate army under General Kirby Smith. On the morning of May 9th, Davis, who had met Verena two days earlier, arrived at a clearing a mile north of Irwinville, Georgia. Tired from a long day of marching, they encamped along the banks of a small stream. Unbeknownst to the Confederate president, for several days he had been pursued by two regiments of Union cavalry. Sensing an opportunity to capture him, the two regiments took up positions on opposite sides of the camp. At dawn, they attacked. Poor communication between the regiments, however, caused them to open fire at each other. Taking advantage of this confusion, Davis attempted to flee the camp. But a Union soldier spotted him and commanded him to stop. Davis rushed toward the men in an attempt to overpower him. But Verena intervened by throwing herself between the two men. Davis therefore had no choice but to surrender. Of course, been the long-standing notion that Jefferson Davis, on May 10th, 1865, at Irwinville, Georgia, attempted to escape capture by wearing one of his wife's dresses. This is, of course, nonsense. It's always been nonsense. And even the Union cavalryman, whose name I believe was Munger, M-U-N-G-E-R, who captured him, later said Davis was not wearing a dress. He was wearing a coat called a Raglan, R-A-G-L-A-N, named after the famous Lord Raglan who commanded the charge of the Light Brigade. And what better way to tarnish a man's ability to be a hero than to say that at the end he was a coward who tried to escape in a woman's dress. Mm. And that's a myth that really played into the, the needs of the Union War Department. After his capture on May 10th, Davis was taken to Fortress Monroe at the tip of the Virginia Peninsula. He spent the next two years confined in a small cell inside the fort. You can't execute Jefferson Davis. Lincoln wanted Davis to escape. He didn't want to have to try him because if he tried him for treason and Davis was convicted, he might have to execute him, which made Davis a martyr. Ultimately, uh, Jefferson Davis is charged with treason, but he's never actually tried. He's released on bail, and nothing ever, nothing ever comes of the charges after the two years in prison. After his release, Davis and Verena spent several years traveling in Europe. After his return to the United States, Davis became the president of an insurance company. The insurance company went bankrupt, however, and in order to make some money, Davis published his memoir the rise and fall of the Confederate government. The book was not a success. However, the wealthy widow Sarah Dorsey left Davis her plantation, so he lived out the final years of his life in relative comfort. Davis died in 1889 and was buried in Hollywood Cemetery in Richmond, Virginia.